Hello brothers and sisters of Christ. I uh, got another testimony email. And the reason I'm reading a lot of these lately, brothers and sisters of Christ, is because I wanted to, when I get done with this, I wanted to reiterate why I jump up and down and say praise the Lord for the pandemic. You've got brethren out there that are like, we need to fight, we need to fight, 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 go down guns blazing. Okay. This is going on because God's making this happen. I'm kind of getting into it now and I'm supposed to do it afterwards. Okay, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. God is doing this for a reason. And I'll just jump the gun and say the two reasons we're going to talk about after this is to wake people up to true biblical salvation, to wake people up to salvation, to getting saved. People are getting saved through this pandemic and because of the pandemic, because of all the lies being promoted, they want truth and they go seeking truth. And who's the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. The King James Bible. Okay. Oops. A little dew down there. I didn't know I'd put my Bible. That's why I'm glad I got the good leather. Um, that's the first thing. And the other reason we're going to be talking about a little bit after this is the second reason I praise the Lord for the pandemic is it's waking Christians up. A lot of us that were idle, that weren't working as hard as we should have, we could have been doing more for the Lord, living for the Lord, sanctification. Some of the brethren out there, I had, if you look at people in the past, we had a long time to kind of, we shouldn't have fought God, I fought God, two years. I mean, two years of fighting God with a lot of these addictions and everything. I didn't, they, some people have stories where they gave up addictions the moment they got saved. Praise the Lord. But there's some of us who fought Lord on it, who fought the Lord on it. And what it's going to come down to is what I see going on in the future is when it comes to sanctification, uh, some of the brethren are going to have to mature a lot faster than, than what, I, what I did. Okay, we might end up in, con uh, they, they call them concentration camps, but they're not. They're quarantine camps. In Germany, if you look up the history and look up some of the pictures, there were signs that it said quarantine camp. What happened in Germany, Nazi Germany. Oh, you Jewish people, you're not healthy. We need to quarantine you. Oh, you're a sympathizer to the Jewish people? All of a sudden now you're not healthy. We're going to have to quarantine you too. He was quarantining. And we might have quarantine camps again. Uh, Brother JT, I think it was. There's, Brother JT, there's a few that I watch. But there was one article that I read that showed that they have, um, they're doing quarantine camps all over the world, setting them up as we speak. Okay. Times are going to get tough, times are going to get hard, and you're going to have to mature if you want to be used of God. If you want that light to be bright, you know the light that's in us? When you get saved, when you first get saved, that light isn't that bright. Why? Because it's trying to shine through all the filth in your life to let people know that you're saved. What happens is, is I believe when you first get saved, you're going to have some changes in your life. But over time, as God cleans up your life, that light, Jesus Christ, starts shining more and more in your life. People are going to have to start maturing a lot faster, and they're starting to notice it. I've talked to some of the brethren. Um, with this pandemic that's going on, People, the brethren are having to wake up. We're having to mature faster. We're having to do more work for the Lord. We're getting, we're getting busy for the Lord because we believe He can come back, hopefully. Uh, you, you believe He can come back any day now. All right, so right now within the body of Christ, the first dangerous teaching that I always said was a dangerous teaching is to teach that there's things that we can agree to disagree on. And at first, I, I used to teach that. I used to teach that. And it got to the point where God convicted me and said, Listen, where does that say that in the Bible? It doesn't say it anywhere in the Bible. Paul is crying night and day with tears because you've got wolves in sheep's clothing coming in and scattering the flock. Why? Because it makes it where the flock is not one mind. Paul's always saying, Be of one mind, one body. One mind, one body. You're supposed to be on the same page when it comes to the Word of God and your stands for the Word of God. There is no we can agree to disagree. Okay, I mean think about it. One mind, one body. Know what that promotes? Unity. Coming together. What does the things that we can agree to disagree on do? It causes division. It causes separation. Because anytime you have a disagreement and you guys can't come together, that disagreement's always going to fester and fester until it causes division every time. There is no, we can agree to disagree. So anyway, there was that teaching that I was wrong in teaching. 
if I, when I said it in the past, I was wrong. We need to be of one mind and one body. We need to come together and be on the same page. The other thing that I'm noticing in these last days, another dangerous teaching among the body of Christ, not these fakes and frauds out there, among the body of Christ is, is that we went from Jesus could come back any day. That's why the Bible says until then we're supposed to um, abound in the work of the Lord. But I'm trying to think of the other words where it says be, but be bold, stand, stand, stand. We're to abound in the work of the Lord. Until the catching away of the body of Christ happens, and we're supposed to be looking for it every day. And because we're looking for it every day, we tell ourselves we need to get as much done for the Lord as we possibly can. We need to abound in the work of the Lord. And some of the brethren, uh, they've been starting to talk, and they're like, well, I think we're going to be here for a few years, and we're going to be going through some very hard times. So instead of looking for Jesus Christ to come back, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for those hard times. I know I, oh, these hard times are coming, so I got to start prepping. I got to start prepping. I got to start prepping. Instead of saying, okay, Jesus could come back any day. I'm going to bust my butt for the Lord, and I'm going to do as much work for the Lord. I'm going to hand out more gospel tracts. I'm going to face to face handing out gospel tracts. Um, Brother and sister of Christ, I, this isn't a pat on the back, it's a praise the Lord thing. I am trying to get courage to walk up to a lot of these people around here. Because um, these are retirement community, you get when you're trying to witness to older people, they're pretty much set. They're really set in their ways. God can still save them. I've handed out more gospel tracts during this pandemic, face to face. You want to know why? Because I would, I, I would always just lay in places in the businesses. I'd lay them everywhere and everything. But when I got kicked out of the businesses because I don't wear a mask, I don't take the death shot, and I get kicked out of these businesses. The only alternative that I had was, is I want to continue working for the Lord. I had to get the courage to start handing gospel tracts out. So why do I keep jumping up and down and saying, praise the Lord for this pandemic? People are getting saved because of it. God's using it to His glory. It's waking the Christians, the brethren up. You need to get sanctified. You need to get your life right. Look what's going on in the world. I could come back any day now, get your life right with me, this is the Lord, and get busy abounding in my, the work that I have for you, whatever God's called you to do. You're going to abound in the work of the Lord. But when you start getting this mindset and people start teaching that, you know what, I don't think Jesus is coming back today. I think it's, it might be four years down the road or five years down the road or ten years down the road. You know what you're doing? You're taking your eyes off Jesus Christ and you're putting it on the world. And there's been a lot of proof of that and evidence. We've seen men. Okay, I started to fall forward. And I started not doing as much work for the Lord. Hey, right, brother, that's dangerous. We need to stick with what the Word says. We need to be looking for that blessed hope every day of your life. You need to live every day as if Jesus can come back any day now. He can come back today. What have I done for the Lord today? Okay, this morning I started with the Word of God. Praise you, O Lord. I didn't forget that. Uh, I prayed before I started my day. Um, I was doing some work for you. Like, even if you're gardening and stuff, trying to get good, wholesome food for the body. Uh, I listened to a couple Bible studies, men in ministry. I put out two or three videos this week. Praise the Lord. I fellowship with some of the brethren to encourage them to stay in the Word of God and to abound in the work of the Lord. On and on and on. You're supposed to do that every day. Okay, what have I done for the Lord today? What have I done for the Lord today? Look at how bad it is out there. He would come back any day now. Any day now. Now I was supposed to do this at the end. We probably talk some more at the end too. But I got a testimony from a sister in Christ. Okay, During this pandemic, and a lot of the, the lies and deception from false religion, from their government and everything, got her to want truth. Or actually got her brother, because we read her brother's testimony. Got her brother to want truth, and then her brother shared the truth with her that she didn't have. All because of the pandemic. So everybody keeps saying this pandemic is just so evil and wicked. And we gotta fight it. We gotta fight it. Let's listen to this testimony by a sister in Christ, the type of person she was before she got saved, and the type of person she is now. My name is the sister in Christ, and I'm 19 years old. I've been listening to your videos, and from what I've heard, I find you to be a very righteous man. I always like to stop there. I, I should be able to take compliments. Please understand. Thank you for the compliment. But I give God the glory. Like I said, two years after getting saved, 
probably a little bit over two years of fighting God. Okay? When you get saved, that's when sanctification starts. That's when you start cleaning, God starts cleaning up your life and starts telling you what to do and what not to do. And some of us fight God. I've heard stories of brethren that were able to give up their tests, uh, give up to give up their addictions on the spot. They got saved and they quit their addiction on the spot. Then I've had testimonies, I'm one of them, where brethren fight the Lord on it for a while before they give it up. And it's a hard, a hard road to go down when you fight the Lord on things. It's a hard road. So where I am today, to God be the glory. There's no way I could be where I am today without the Lord, without His perfect written word. There's no way I could be here. So I wanted to share my testimony with you. My brother, the brother in Christ, has sent you his testimony. So I felt the need to send you mine as well. I lived in Montreal, Canada for most of my life. I grew up Catholic and attended church almost every weekend with my father. I'm going to stop there for a second. Uh, Catholicism, brothers and sisters in Christ, understand it's control taken over everywhere. And um, I've been watching some of the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, men of the faith, women of the faith, um, martyrs. Like, there's it's just a cartoon series, and they might, some of them, I had to say, uh, no, that's Catholic. Um, garbage. But some of it were the stories that I've heard from other ministers in ministry. <laughs> some birds are up there. Uh, some uh, ministries where they've talked about these uh, brethren that go out and try to uh, take the word of God to other countries and, and um, to lead people to Christ in these third world countries and just other countries. And there was a while when the King James Bible came out, that's one of the fruits of the King James Bible, is that when it came out, it went to all the world. You had uh, people going out in ministry, missionaries, going all over the world to try to preach this word. And a lot of them died for the word. A lot of them had a lot of hardship and a lot of sacrifices. One of them, uh, the guy, uh, went through so much hardship and everything, and at the very end, when he got to doing things seemed to die down, he lost his wife and his child. A lot of sacrifices to get this book out there and preach the word. But the point I'm making is, is at one time, this, the word of God went out throughout the whole world. But every place you go back today, past tense, you look, oh, praise the Lord. Present tense, you go and look at all those areas and they've been infested by Catholicism. The Bible believe there's very few Bible believers left. It's all been infested by Catholicism. Everywhere. Canada is one of them big place. Okay. I remember always bothering I'm sorry I'm sorry uh, I grew up Catholic and attended church almost every weekend with my father I remember always bothering him her father to go to church with me. I wanted to understand more about religion and to engage myself in it. My father brought me to two churches. One of them was Slovenian church where I barely understood what they were saying because 80% of the sermon was in Slovenian. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My father also brought me to an English church, but I never really learned anything. I was really young at the time, but I still wanted to learn about who Jesus Christ really was. I remember going to church and being thrown in the back with the other children where I could withdraw. I was so frustrated. I went to my father and demanded that I wanted to leave. After that, I started to turn away from religion. That's why the Bible teaches, and like I said, brothers, right now, the world does not go according to this book. The whole world now is openly. It used to be trying to hide it and slowly sneak it in. It is now hardcore, 100% openly against this book. The ways of the world are contrary to the Word of God. Okay, The parents are to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. It was her father's place, if he was truly saved, and he wasn't. It's her father's place and her mother's place to teach her who Jesus is. But if they don't know who Jesus is, how can they teach their children? I understand that. But remember, God's way is, is it's not the Babel buildings. It's the parents that are supposed to be teaching their children Jesus Christ and his word, the Ten Commandments. Okay. So what happens when you have a lost world that's part of a false organized religious system? You get someone that wants to know the truth and they get blocked. They put, the wall gets put in front of them. They get, don't get told the truth. 
Now don't get me wrong, she won't be able to find the truth in that place. But you, hopefully you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I stopped asking my dad to go to church and started noticing how self-righteous other Catholics were. Okay. My biggest thing is there's nothing wrong. If you want to say self-righteous, there's nothing wrong. But the Bible, I always like to say this, the Bible says they go about to establish their own righteousness. Establish. In other words, there's, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none righteous. So we kind of adopted this saying of self-righteousness when the Bible condemns that. There's no such thing as self-righteousness. Because that's saying you can have your own righteousness apart from Jesus Christ. All right. Now, like I said, I'm not giving you a hard time, but I'm just saying the Bible says they go about to establish their own righteousness. In other words, it's a lifelong process that's doomed for failure. It's a lifelong process that they're, they're going around trying to establish their own righteousness, and it's doomed to fail every time. But I understand what this sister in Christ is talking about. We have people that are so self-righteous, especially in Catholicism, but in... Um, uh, what is it? Jehovah's Witness. I've come across them. Once again, they're trying to establish their own righteousness. Lifelong process. They don't know whether they're saved or not, so it's a lifelong process, and they're going to fail every time. Same thing with Mormons and all that. The, I, we call them daughters of the whore in the Bible. It talks about the daughters of the whore of Babylon. Uh, they're just Catholicism, a different brand of Catholicism. All these orga all organized religion out there today, even the Babel building systems that started out innocent, saying we just want a place where we can worship and sing and come together and listen to the word of God being preached. Catholicism have infiltrated those places. They're all daughters of the whore. All organized religion out there. It's just daughters of the whore. And they're all about us. Uh, you'll see self-righteous people in these Babel buildings everywhere. I'm sorry, I even said it. You'll see these people that are going about to establish their own righteousness. One of the biggest deceptions today is the easy believism. You know, I believe, therefore I've earned salvation. I've established my own righteousness. Uh, no, you have to repent and believe. No, repentance is works. Even prayer, I don't even have to ask God to save me. I've earned it. It's faith alone. I've earned it. You see what I'm saying? Those of us who have studied the Bible realize, no, I fell on my knees and begged God to save me. This dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner that you're looking at right now, I fell on my knees. The, the man that she's saying, this very righteous man, I fell down on my knees and begged God to save me. This new movement of easy believism, you don't do that anymore. You just believe in your head and you've earned it. You've earned salvation. You went about, you went about establishing your own righteousness and you feel like you have because you've earned it with your belief. But the fact of the matter is, they're still lost and on their way to hell. But I understand what the sister of Christ is saying. Sorry to get off on a, on a side note. My dad's side of the family were religious, but very, were a family of scorners. You know, looking down on people. That's why I stop right here. That's why the Bible, uh, I want to do a teaching on it eventually, and I will, uh, where the Bible talks about... Uh, in the past, we were without God in the world and we were without hope. And it tells us to remember that. It also tells us to remember the old man. We're supposed to remember what kind of person we were. You look at this man that's, standing, that's sitting right here, the sister in Christ says, Oh, he's, he's a very righteous man. Well, I have Jesus' righteousness and the man that I am today, like I said, it's 100% what God did in me. It's the work that God has done in me through His Word. But i got to remember, I wasn't always that man. I was a, just a wicked, wicked man. I was a false convert. I was not shining the light of Jesus Christ to the world. I was helping create false converts. I was giving people a false sense of what uh, a fake, I was giving them a fake Christianity. I was a wicked, wicked man. It's one thing to be in sin. It's another thing to mislead people into thinking they're saved when they're lost. That's just utter wickedness. I was a wicked man. And the Bible says we're supposed to remember who we were before we got saved. Because that helps us when we go to preach the Word of God to people, the plan of salvation. When we go to lead people to Christ. We don't go by somebody and look at them and go, 
judging them from the outward appearance. The Bible says be, uh, don't, we're not to judge on the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. A lot of times, brethren, don't tell me it hasn't happened to you, where you go by and you look at someone and you, your courage fails you, and you look at them and go, well, they wouldn't want Jesus Christ anyway, and you turn around and walk the other way. You forget who you were when you were lost. You forget. Thank God that, that, that uh, the person, my uncle, who pointed me to King James Video Ministries, that he didn't have that attitude with me. That brother in Christ didn't have that attitude with me, saying, hey, you know what? He's so into video games, movies, TV shows. He's so worldly. You know, he doesn't want Jesus Christ. I'm not going to lead him to Jesus Christ. We, gotta, we can't forget that, brother and sister Christ, where we came from. The lost man's supposed to stay dead and buried, but we're not to forget him when it comes to our heart for the lost world and preaching the plan of salvation. Yes, you're supposed to wait for doors to open, but I'm telling you right now, there's doors opening. We're reading a testimony right now. There's doors opening. And brethren are kind of complain and whine and say, well, there's just no doors, so that's why I'm not preaching. There's doors opening. You're just lacking the courage. And you're using anything and everything as an excuse not to preach the plan of salvation. I'm pointing at me first. I always talked about this when I first got into ministry and started doing some videos. I explained to you guys that I still need more courage. I still need more courage when it comes to preaching the plan of salvation to people face to face and handing out gospel tracts to people face to face. God's working on me. He is. So I'm pointing at me as much as I'm pointing at you. Okay? The door's there. You go out in public and the guy walks by, you're it. that's a door. I go walking on the beach and every man that walks by, I say, hello, how are you? Every woman, man that walks by, I say, how are you and how are you doing today? To see if the door, because the door's there, you're face to face, the door's there. Now they can slam it right back in your face. They can slam the door shut right back in your face. But the door's there. And people say, well, that's not a door. That's not a door. They've actually got to run all the way up to me and say, tell me about Jesus before I'll even say a word. You're going to be waiting a long time in these last days, brothers and sisters of Christ. you got to say hello to the people, lost people. you got to talk to them. Ask them how they're doing. And when a door might open about, you know, the, the truth, the, the pandemic, is just, I just see them like they're lying to us and be like, they are lying to you. They're not telling you the truth. But let me tell you about the truth. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. They're lying to you, but let me tell you the truth. There's doors there, brothers and sisters of Christ. There's doors there. But you have the families that are scorners. They judge my brother and I for not being righteous. Okay? Now, please understand, there's a difference between casting judgment like you're God, because right, these people do, that are very, they go about to establish their own righteousness. Look at me, I'm holy, you're a dog. They have that attitude. But when it comes to a brother and sister in Christ, in your walk with, for the sister in Christ and for all those newly saved, you're going to have brethren every once in a while look at you and say, hey, you need to do a study on this part of the Bible because what they're saying is there's something in your life that you still haven't given up that you need to give up for Christ. We are to judge one another, but I'm not to judge you like I'm holier than thou. Okay, I'm, I understand how to say it. I'm holier than the lost world because God, like I said, God comes into my life and he cleans up my life and tells me what to do. And when it's someone's newly saved versus someone who's been saved for a while, yes, that person might be a little bit more holier than that person. But the thing is, I'm not supposed to be like a Nicolaitan. I say it like that way. I'm not supposed to be like a Nicolaitan and hoard it over the brethren. Look at me and look how clean I am and how God is. Fit. To God be the glory. And I'm here to help you and be a servant to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Not lord over you, but be a servant. So you're going to have in your walk, sister in Christ, with some of the brethren, they're going to try to help you put their hand out. And they need to do it with love, okay, with charity. But they're going to be holding their hand out saying, hey, you know, now that you're saved, here's a Bible. Here's some things you can look at, you know, Ephesians 5. Okay, it's a great one for the changed life, Ephesians chapter 5. But I understand what she's talking about with the lost world. The lost world just rubs their nose at us. I don't believe what you believe. Especially religious people. 
I'm just better than you and I'm holier than thou in the sense that I'm good and you're a dog. I'm perfect and you're a dog. I'll say it like that. Brothers and sisters Christ, I'm not perfect. But the man that's in me, he is. And he's showing me the way day by day. He's showing me the way day by day. They constantly judge us, but they involved but they involve themselves in the cares of this world. Remember the study we did? Cares of this world, though they didn't even own a Bible and were alcoholics. Okay. I like the Bible word drunkard. I'm not getting on anybody if they say alcoholic. Um, but the Bible talks about drunkards. Um, but right here when she says the cares of this world, what's one of the three things that prevents somebody from getting saved? When a lot of these people, I mean, they've been told of a Jesus Christ, and that piques your interest. Remember the Bible talks about some people preach Jesus for this reason, some people preach Jesus for that reason, for this reason, but regardless, Jesus is preached. So when you have someone over here teaching a false Jesus, the fact that Jesus is preached, it opens your heart and your mind saying, I want to know who this Jesus is. Okay, this person ain't telling the truth, now I'm going to go here. Okay, that person isn't telling the truth, now I'm going to go over here. That's the truth. I'm going to go here. King James Bible. That's the truth. But they're seeking it. Okay. But what was the three things that uh, uh, prevent the Word of God from being fruitful and preventing people from getting saved? Fruitful in the life of a Christian, but prevent people from getting saved to begin with? Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lusts of other things. Those three things. She mentions one of those. Cares of this world. That they didn't even own a Bible. <laughs> That's... <laughs> That's the Catholic way. You know, you have a Bible, but it just gathers dust. Or you might not even own a Bible. It doesn't matter. It's the church. It's the, the man's wisdom. The wisdom of man. And what did God do? He makes foolish the wisdom of men. And they are alcoholics. If you uh, listen to the testimony that I did uh, a week or two ago uh, about her brother, uh, her brother, her real brother, but it's also a brother in Christ, he talked about that, that he had to deal with parents that were alcoholics. My mother's side was even worse. My mother used my father for money and it ran in the family. My mother always told me as a child to go for a successful man. I knew very early on that meant to go for a man with money. The only thing my father provided was money and I despised that. He was never the spiritual head and that's the only thing I really needed growing up. Now. Here's the thing for sisters in Christ that are single out there, and I tell the brothers in Christ this. The way the Bible teaches, brother in Christ, if you're newly saved, you're not ready for marriage. You need to get your life cleaned up. Same thing for the sisters in Christ. If you're newly slay, saved, you need to get in this book and say, Lord, show me what I need to do. How, what do I need to clean up? How am I supposed to live my life? The Bible talks about it. For, for uh, sister in Christ, you need to practice being a good keeper at home. You need to fight practice fighting feminism and get it out of your life so you can be ready for a head covering be under the authority of a man head covering okay men you're newly saved you need to clean up your life too and get all the wickedness and sin out of your life as you possibly can but like I said it's gonna, it's a it's gonna take time it's a process but you grab this book and say Lord show me what I'm not supposed to be doing and show me what I'm supposed to be doing 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Be not drunken. No fornicating. Okay? You get a lot of stuff out of your life and get cleaned up. Then the second thing that I always say for the men is, is if you're living in a small studio apartment, that's just like, a, I, I was I, the first place I ever lived in outside my home, well, and outside my grandparents' home, because I went to live with my grandparents at 18 for a year, I moved into a little, it was just the size of a bedroom, and it had a permanent bed built in with two nightstands, and at the foot of the bed was a little desk with a microwave and a little mini fridge, and, and it had a little sink on the side and a little bathroom, and that was it. I had a part-time job and was barely getting by. If you're in that situation, you're not ready for marriage yet. Please hear me out. You, the Bible says a man that provide not for his own, he's worse than an infidel. So sisters in Christ, when you've got men out there, oh, I love Jesus Christ, and they're living with their mom, uh, 
mom and dad, I'm not knocking for living with their mom and dad, but they're living with their mom and dad, they don't have a job, they can't provide, they're not the man for you. Right? They're just not the man for you. And I'm going for the sister in Christ. So what Satan likes to do is he likes to take things that God says and he likes to pervert them. So instead of saying, okay, make sure that he can provide. Provide means that he can have a roof over your head, clothes on your back, and food in your stomach. It's not talking about being rich. But Satan likes to twist it and tell you, you need to go for the richest man. I'm telling you right now, you need to go for a godly man first. And when you see that he's a godly man, then that godly man, you let him know that I want to be married to you, I want to be with you, but can you provide for me? And if you can't, I'll sit here and wait for you to get up and, and pray to the Lord, and God will open doors for that man so he can get a good job, get some income, where he can provide for you so you guys can be married. But uh, that's me going off a little bit, but bottom line, you're newly saved, you're not ready for marriage. God's got some work to do on you, uh, brother or sister in Christ. When God's got your life to the point where, okay, I've been saved for six months to a year, things are doing good, I've, I've, God's gotten a lot of bad things out of my life, I'm starting to learn the right things I was lied to by this world. Uh, a husband's going to look for a woman that's wanting to be a good keeper at home and bear children. A good man of God is going to want a wife and, ch and children. He's going to want a family. And he's a, a wife that's going to be a keeper at home. And the husband... Like I said, a wife, a good sister in Christ for the men out there. They're going to be looking for a man who's strong in the faith with the life that you're living. But also that you can provide for them. Right? Provide for them. But I understand what she was talking about. Back in the day, uh, I think that's what they told a lot of the girls. You need to go for the men that have money. And uh, My grandfather was in uh, the military. And that was a big thing too, that you need to find you a nice military man that has got money. He's got an income. Okay. Uh, godly man is the first thing. Godly woman is the first thing. Then you look at the other things that God says to look at. But I can see what she was going through. Her mom wasn't teaching her to be a good keeper at home and wasn't teaching her to look for a godly man. Her, from what I've heard from her, because I fellowship with them, from her brother and her, their mom wouldn't know a godly man if she saw one. And I literally mean that because her son who is a godly man now, has tried witnessing to her. She wouldn't know a godly man if she saw one. And there was one right in front of her. Um, my parents always neglected me. Every time I went to my parents for help, they never provided it for me. My father always told me to be nice, and it made me afraid of conflict. And I didn't know how to stand up for myself because of that. Well, here's the thing sister in Christ, and it's the thing with a lot of sisters in Christ. The Bible talks about how a woman's attitude, they're supposed to be meek, they're supposed to be mild, have a quiet spirit, okay? The way the Bible says it, your father, a saved father, is supposed to be standing up for you. A brother in Christ is supposed to be standing up for you. Your husband, a saved husband, that's how messed up this world is. Things aren't being, are just 100% against what the Bible teaches, okay? Feminism teaches that women have the right to get out there and hoot and holler with the men and stand up for themselves and be men. No, the men are supposed to be the head coverings. Your father was supposed to be a head covering and he wasn't. We read about this. She says she was, he wasn't. Okay, Her brother right now is her head covering, taking care of her. And, and I, I said, I've talked with him. He's, he's, he's a good man. He's a good man. He loves the Lord. He's learning more and more from the Lord every day. And he's working to clean up his life. Okay. but the quiet spirit women are supposed to have a quiet spirit but as far as the standing up for you that's where your father failed you and when your father failed um, I talked to the brother in Christ he realized that he failed her until he got saved and when he got saved he's like I ain't going to fail her again and he witnessed to her and led her to Christ and now he's not failing her again he's being the best head covering he can be for his sister my mother, on the other hand, made things ten times worse for me. She ruined most of my friendships because every time I came to her with a problem, she would get involved and tell false information about me to try to make, it says, make look bad. I think it's trying to make her look bad. She always got involved in my life and was very controlling. Now, I always stop there, Brother Jesus Christ, because for anybody, uh, a good Bible-believing, God-fearing 
hus uh, man, husband, wife, that's going to be a father and a mother. Uh, the, the lost world says, oh, they're too controlling. No, they're doing what they're told to do. They're supposed to raise you in the admonition of the Lord. They're supposed to discipline you. They're supposed to teach you trade skills. Daughters, how to be good keepers at home. Husbands or sons, how to have a good trade skill so you can provide for a keeper at home someday. I was never taught good great trade skills going up. The best trade skill I had was playing video games. I could play music a little bit, but for the most part I didn't have any good trade skills. My grandfather was a, uh, he was a mechanic in the Air Force working on planes. He could fix anything. I should have gone around him and said, hey, teach me. Teach me how to fix cars, how to work on cars. You know, teach me how to fix things. Teach me how things basically work. But I always say this, woodworking, plumbers, electrician, uh, people that work on homes, carpenters, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, those are good trade skills that we desperately need in these last days. Gardeners, you know, uh, farmers, those are the trade skills we need nowadays. Not computer techs, not um, big business and working behind a desk pushing papers all day. We need the physical work because it might get that bad that things are going to go back. They call it the dark ages. Things might go back to the old ways a little bit before the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay. But I just want to say some parents can be over controlling as far as they're just they, they, they have an authority issue like a power trip issue. I understand that. But I just don't want you to be put off by the fact that someday that this sister in Christ if we're here long enough I pray the Lord comes back any day and I try to live like he can come back any day but if we're long enough that this sister in Christ God cleans her life up and she finds a good godly man and gets married she needs to understand that for her daughter she needs to be a mother to her daughter not a best friend a mother and that means you are going to be in her life all of her all of her whole life okay there is no the child has a right to privacy and a child has a right to her own that's not scripture that's anti-scripture okay the, the parents raise the child in the admonition of the Lord the parents teach the children teach the young man how to be a man someday teach the young woman how to be a godly woman someday they're in your life 24 7 okay. but some people can be a power trip I've seen that before where they're just mean and they abuse that authority that God has given them they abuse it absolutely she never let me go out into the world and experience things. I'm sorry, Sister in Christ. <laughs> I have to disagree with you. I would not. I have my daughter. Like I said, this reminds me of my daughter. I try to explain to her how life is here. She can come visit me all I want. I, I don't have full custody of my daughter. I was lost when I had my daughter, and I didn't do things God's way. I did things the world's way. And look where it led me. Really messed up. Okay. But if I had full custody of my daughter, there is no... You get to go in the world and experience it. It's my job to protect her from the world. I know how wicked this world is. I know how many wolves in sheep's clothing are on out there. The Bible talks about a man, a woman without her head covered, tempts the angels. A woman that has no saved father head covering, or a husband, or a brother in Christ, or a pastor as a head covering, that they're obeying, not just because they watch him online, that they're emailing him, asking him questions and he's trying to be like a father to him saying this is how you're supposed to do things according to the scriptures a head covering it tempts the angels it tempts Satan to come in and start whispering the Bible says by good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple it's also deceiving those women out there that don't have head coverings okay. so be careful with that sister in Christ I just want to say I understand that they can be overbearing I think um, it might be on here because I've read this a few times. Uh, we'll get to it where they wouldn't even let you play in the in the front yard on the grass. Wouldn't let you go. It wouldn't take you out hiking. Wouldn't take you out to see God's creation and stuff like that. See, that's overboard. That's really overboard. But when it comes to you want to go out in the world and experience the world, that's the worst thing for you. It's the worst thing for you. There's wickedness in the world, and she, I understand your father didn't do his job. But I'm telling you, as a, as a brother in Christ, and as a, a preacher and a teacher, and with love, we're here to protect you. Okay, The world, you go out in the world by yourself without a head covering, and it's going to eat you up. 
it's going to mess you up and it's going to lead you down the wrong path, 50, 50 wrong paths. Remember, straight and narrow is the way to heaven. Broad is the gate that leads to the destruction. You know, There's tons of paths that will go this way, that way, that's going to lead you astray. She wouldn't allow me to stay at friends' houses or go anywhere on my own. And like I said, it would be nice to have a house church where you have you can play with other brethren's children that are being raised in the admonition of the Lord. But when I was growing up as a false Christian, I had a lot of so-called friends in these uh, so-called educational system that led me astray and got me in a lot of trouble. And later on in life, I realized I really only had a couple friends, just a couple. I didn't have a lot of friends. I had a lot of acquaintances, people that you just hung out with while you're at school. Okay. So, like I said, I would still, like I said, it's not that we're controlling, it's our job to protect our children. So if I tell, if I see some girls over there talking about, you know, bad things and going and doing bad things, and I tell my daughter, if I had my daughter here, I'd be like, you don't hang out with them. You just stay away from them. Why? Because I know where they're heading, and that's not the place I want for my daughter, and if my, and I love my daughter, I'd be like, you don't want to go there either. There's a lot of sisters in Christ and brothers that have testimonies where they went a direction that they were told not to go and they knew in their heart they shouldn't have gone that way but they still did anyway either out of stubbornness or pride or, or re rebelling against authority, the head covering and they, had, they fell flat on their face and they regretted it. I do. I have stories where I've done things I've don't do that and I did it anyway. My grandfather would always tell us, don't do this, you need to be doing this. And I went and did things my own way. But I understand, like I said, house church. That's why I'm so desperate for house churches. So you can have brother, uh, uh, other kids around that are being raised in the admonition of the Lord that they can go out there on the swing. They can play out in the yard. Okay. Yeah. But I, uh, I know... Uh, Growing up, I knew some uh, people that they went to school and went home, and they weren't allowed to go anywhere. Just school and home, school and home. That was it. And it does take its toll a little bit. Mainly because school messes you up, but you don't have to have friends. Some people try to say you have to have friends growing up to be a good, a good people person. No. Back in the day, people used to be so spread out. It was miles to the next homestead, and the children were raised. You know who the children's friends were? It's when you had multiple kids. <laughs> I, I was in a family of three boys. So there for a while when we were poor, living in Oklahoma, and my best friend was my brother. We were lost. We got into, we were called what you call hell raisers. We got into so much trouble, stole from my mom, broke into a stadium to fly a kite all the time. Um, we, we broke things, destroyed things. Um, we got into all kinds of trouble, and this was before I was 10 years old. Um, but my best friend, because I didn't have friends, was my brother. So when you had families that had multiple children, you played with your brothers. Okay? And when you got old enough to start learning trade skills, you, the, the son starts following the father around. The daughter starts following the mother around all the time. Okay? But that's where your friends are. So. For what I'm saying here, without going off too much for the sister in Christ, is that that could have been a blessing in disguise. Now, there's a lot of times the Bible talks about blessings, you know, and they, they, when you look into them, it's like sometimes they're blessings in disguise um, because you could have gotten way more messed up okay, by going out into the world. But their reasoning was the wrong reasoning. Okay? They weren't doing it for the Lord and for His Word, and they were doing it because they love you. I understand that. During my teenage years, I started having a lot of problems at school. I was made fun of and ignored by almost everyone in my high school. I was outcasted for having different opinions. I didn't agree with feminism or the whole left-wing narrative that everyone was surrounded by. I eventually left the private school, and that's what shocked me. She was talking about a private school. They treated that as a private school? That's usually like a public school. They go crazy. So we select a private school and that I was attending and decided to go to public school where I thought people were down to earth. Uh, before I went, my brother and I became very close. While my parents were neglecting me, he decided to teach me everything he knew. Praise the Lord for that brother. 
My brother and I didn't have the best relationship growing up, but he became my best friend. That's, I'm sorry, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's who you're going to be your, your best friends are your, when you're growing up. It's supposed to be a, your brothers and sisters. He taught me how to stand up for myself, distance myself from my parents as they were toxic and didn't care for me, and how to experience life. He became your head covering. Praise the Lord. From the age of 14, my brother and I became inseparable. My mother always tried to get, tried to get, take me away. I think she's trying to say, my mother always tried to take me away from him, but I always felt this strong urge to stick by him. I believe the Lord wanted me to stick by him as he, as he benefited my life and eventually led me to Christ. And if you remember listening to his testimony, he was like, I'm being lied to by the world, the pandemic that's going on in the world. So I'm going to look at these other conspiracies that are going on. Then he started typing in, I want truth. I want truth. He got led to the salvation message of Brother Brian's uh, King James Video Ministries. It led to the Bible version issue. Studies. Okay. When I attended public school, I found myself being more miserable. Yeah. That's why I was going to wait till we got to that point. Because I was like, when I first read the first part, uh, that you might have regretted that going to a public school. I mean, private schools aren't any better today. But at one time, they were better than going to a public school. As long as that private school wasn't Catholic. <laughs> but chances are it was here. Because um, she was raised Catholic. But as long as it wasn't a Catholic private school. Uh, a lot of bad things happened there. Um, but she goes, I'm miserable. I hated the government education. I was being forced to learn. I was being forced to learn and I hated the people I was surrounded by. Uh, forced to learn bad things maybe. I just read an article where they're talking about how they're trying to, here in Oregon, they're passing some kind of legislation or something where they're foregoing, in other words, they're just basically giving people high school diplomas whether they can read, write, or do math. They're just, that's not important anymore. And it was always heading that way, brothers and sisters of Christ, because that's all they were supposed to be teaching in these public schools. They were supposed to be teaching your children to read, to write, and to do math. It was always like that. Reading, writing, arithmetic. Reading, writing, arithmetic. That's all you need to know to make it in this world. Reading, writing, arithmetic. And you know what? That's still the same for today. That's all you need to know to make it in this world. You say, what about being a computer tech? You go to a special school for that. But can you read? You can read the booklets. You can read the books they give you. You can write. You can do math. If you're really good at math, you can be a good uh, computer programmer. But I'm just saying, what about electricians? Same thing. You know how to read, write, and do math? Then you can learn to be a great electrician, a great plumber, a great uh, woodworking, carpenter. That was the three things that they came out and said, we're only going to teach these to your children. What happened? Over the years, they added so much junk that has nothing to do with those three things, and now they're taking those three things away. So you go to school, there's people coming out of school. Even back when my uncle was young, he talked about how he could hardly read. He had to learn how to read for himself. The school didn't teach him. So even back before I was born, <laughs> they were struggling with this. But it was, I think it was a whole plan. It all, they planned it from the beginning. They wanted to get people to come out of these schools thinking they're smart when they're dumb as can be because the most important skills that you need more than anything is reading, writing, and arith uh, arithmetic, math. Those are the most If you're homeschooling your child, that's all you really need to teach your child, reading, writing, and arithmetic. You teach them how to read through the Bible. You know, if they can read that Bible and pronounce those words, the Bible, you teach them how to read the Webster's 1828 Dictionary and you go through the words and the definitions. Um, you teach them how to read and write and do math and they'll, be, they'll survive just fine in this world. And as they grow up, uh, I'll use Brother Brian as an example. His, his, Brother Brian is really good at uh, carpentry work, woodworking, and I've watched people do it. It takes measurement. Um, it takes patience, but it takes measuring, and sometimes you've got to read things to figure, like he's got some old books, I bought some of the old books too that teach about the old like refining, refining metals, metallurgy, um, woodworking, gardening, and this. You can read up on stuff and say, okay, what am I doing wrong here? Is there a better way to do this or an easier way? And you can read. 
and you have to always write. You have to draw and write words, and you have to draw and write like links and stuff like that. You, you're taking notes when you're doing woodworking and stuff like that. He can learn that from his father, but he can only learn that from his father if, and I know they are, if they're teaching him reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's what's important. The Word of God is the most important thing, but you got to know how to read or have someone to read it for you. Back in the old days, you had one Bible per family, and those that can read would read the most. But then they'd start teaching the younger how to read through that Bible, because that was the only book they had in the house. I began drinking more as it was the only way I could get some relief. My alcohol problems became more worse once I ended high school. And this is the testimony, Brother says, right? There's people that when they go searching for truth, or they seek for answers, or they seek for a cure... Sometimes they go down some bumpy roads in the wrong directions before they find the right direction. And that's what she's talking about. I drank more and more, because I know we just mentioned her brother led her to Christ, but this is still before she became saved. She, she went different directions, the wrong directions, until the right direction was shown her. I drank more and more every day to the point where I was drinking two bottles of wine every day. I was always trying to fill a void. I didn't realize at the time that it was the Lord that I needed in my life to make me feel whole. I became so depressed that I self-harmed. As soon as I did that, I felt this overwhelming feeling of shame and embarrassment. She was becoming broken. Okay. And that's the biggest thing. There's a difference between brethren. I've come across brethren that when they testimony, they were broken. They were broken. They had shame. You know what the Bible talks about? Uh, these fake Christians out there whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, sin. They sh they're, they're, they're glorying in their shame, their sin. Who mind earthly things, whose end is destruction. You have to come to a point where you just, you're miserable. You're broken. And that's when you're in a, pro I'm just dirty and filthy, I'm wrong in what I'm doing. I need to be saved. That's the point she's getting to. I know now that it was the Lord that felt ashamed of me. I had let myself go to the certain point and the Lord had enough. I moved to Ottawa shortly after that and stopped my heavy drinking. I still drank, but I never indulged the way I did before. I was fixing up my life, but I, did, I didn't have Christ in my life yet, so I still had many other problems. Same thing with the, her brother's testimony, and I'll say it here. What some people try to do is they try to clean up their life without Jesus Christ. And they'll get rid of one bad thing, and another bad thing pops up. But what they're doing is they're just tr end up trading one bad thing for another, one bad thing for another, and bouncing around. And they're not really, they're not. There's no. How do you say it? They're not getting anywhere. They're trying to clean up their life, but ultimately they're not getting anywhere. This is another testimony by another sister in Christ that she fell for that, trying to clean up her life before she got saved. I was planning on going to college and getting a job, but when I moved, I became distracted and focused on the lusts of the flesh. I, became, I began fornicating with men to the point where it became out of control. I felt ashamed because I hated, on, hated only seeing myself as a useless harlot. And I'll say this even for men. Men and women out there, when you get into sexual perversion, fornicating, getting messed up with porn, it messes up. It'll mess you up. It really will. It will affect, if you don't get it out of your life, and you don't clean up your life in those areas, it will affect your relationship with the opposite sex. It will. And it will affect, like she said, it will affect how you look at yourself. Just disgusted with yourself. One of the stories in the Bible to go look at, and I'm trying to think of who his name, Anon. It was Absalom's brother. And uh, King David's son, Absalom, and his brother, I think it was Anon, I can't remember, but he, he, he was fallen in love, lust at first sight, I call it lust at first sight, with his sister, who was a half-sister. And he basically forced her to lay with her, and then after it was done, he hated her. Wait a minute, you loved her before, what, but what happens? That's what sexual perversion does. It ruins a relationship between man and woman if it's not done properly according to the Bible okay? you start feeling ashamed of yourself that you read that whole story she was ashamed the daughter was ashamed and the man just 
started hating himself and hating her. So yeah, the Bible teaches it's hard road. And if you watch my testimony, I came out of, uh, I was introduced to porn when I was really young. And you're introduced to porn through Hollywood movies, television shows, video games, sexual perversion, just fornication. It's everywhere now. It's everywhere. And you got to get away from that as a saved sinner. Um, but I can understand how she feels when she just, I just, when God was bringing me down to my knees and I was getting to the point of getting, you know, broken, coming to God as a sinner, I looked at my life and the, my personal sins, not just that we're all sinners, I was looking at my personal sins and going, I'm disgusted by myself. Just utterly disgusted by myself. I'm worthless. I'm, I'm less than worthless. When the fake coronavirus emerged, I remember thinking that it was so ridiculous. For some reason, I never took it seriously. I remember thinking was that this is really bizarre and that something was off. June was when they made masks mandatory. I would always walk into stores without one and it was unbearable. I didn't realize at the time that this was spiritual. I could say anything to these people, they just couldn't understand. I began separating myself from society. This was when I started smoking more and more cannabis. It was my only way to cope with everything going on. Months later, my brother and I agreed that we had no place in society. We had a plan to go into the wilderness and provide for ourselves as we didn't want anything to do with the government. And it's getting that way all over the world. You've got to get it to a point where you've got to learn to sustain yourself. Gardening, hunting, fishing. You can't, we, we never should have been relying on the government to begin with, period. And relying on these grocery stores, hardcore. You need to be provide, doing your best to provide for yourself. That's the whole... I'll start there. That's the whole thing about this deception that's going on. It's something that's been going on all over time. They totally switched everything over so the people, and especially in America, people in America have gotten so dependent on the government taking care of them, so now all the government has to do is say, do what we say or we're cutting you off. And people just fall down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What happens in the time of Jacob's trouble? If you don't take the mark, you don't buy or sell, you don't eat, you don't get clothes, you don't have a roof over your head, they're preparing people to take that mark today. You do what the government tells you. Whatever power that be that tells you. Yes, sir. I've got to keep doing that. Yes, sir. Don't question anything. During that time, I didn't stop my fornication. I almost became pregnant. Even though I was almost always against abortion, I stupidly decided to take a morning after pill because I thought that I would be going into the wilderness for a while. I didn't want to take food out of my family's mouth for a decision I made. I didn't have any faith at the time, and I couldn't bear the thought of taking away from my family. It's one of the biggest regrets of my life, and the most trans traumatizing. I'm sorry, the most traumatizing times. I still cry myself to sleep almost every night and beg for forgiveness from the Lord. Now, if you've watched my study I did recently, when we talked about being justified in the Spirit, where it talks about how that's a child at the moment of conception, that's a person you're with, child. Okay, if you can have the Holy Spirit in the womb, the moment of conception, then it's a person. Okay, my the only thing I can tell this sister in Christ is that um, I remember watching Sheffy, and I love this saying because the Bible teaches it: the wages of sin is death. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Uh, Sheffy talks about we, though we always have to bear the burden of the scars of our sins, God is faithful to forgive and have mercy. Okay. She's going to have to live. Sister in Christ, I love you to death, and I'm not saying this to be mean, but you're going to have to live with that scar for the rest of your life. But God will forgive you, and He has forgiven you. Okay? Use it as a testimony. Use it as a testimony with other, the lost world, and for the body of Christ. Use it as a testimony. Okay? And next time some sister in Christ comes your way, or some lost woman comes your way and starts talking about it, getting a, an abortion, are doing what you did, you can testify. Start telling her about Jesus Christ, how you were wrong in what you did, and that the Lord saved you and forgave you and put you back on the right path. I say put you back, but put you on the right path. Okay. Use it as a testimony. Okay. There's still times, brother, sister in Christ, to this day, there's still times 
They're few and few as you get closer to the Lord and God's cleaning up your life and He's forgiving you and He's giving you joy and He's giving you peace. As you get closer and closer to the Lord, those times get fewer and fewer. But there's still times where I get set in here and I start thinking of some of the bad things I did when I was lost. I even think of some of the mistakes I made as a saved, like a babe in Christ early on, saved. Okay, and I just tear up before the Lord. I just tear up before the Lord. Why is that? Because God will forgive us of our sins, but there are some times that we still have to bear the scars of those sins. Okay. It's that thing that if you're an alcohol, if you're a drunkard for most of your life, and you get and you get cancer, and you get saved, that cancer doesn't just go away. You still have to bear the scars of your sins when it comes to the flesh. But I understand what she says. I've been through it crying myself, I, I, crying to, to the Lord and just getting so down about the person I once was or the mistakes I've made in my past as a Christian. But you got to get past it to the point where it doesn't happen that much and you use it, take it and use it for the Lord. Use it as a testimony. The mistakes I made in my past, I try to use them as a testimony to the brethren and to the people that I come across to the lost world so they don't make the same mistake. We tried living out there, but the Lord made us come back. I'm talking about out in the uh, wilderness. I was still lost at this point. When we came back, I became very depressed and I didn't have hope. I love how she used that word hope. Why? Because remember what the Bible talks about. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what I was talking about before when it comes to preaching salvation to the lost world. When you look at them, remember, that used to be you. If you've already tried witnessing to them once or twice, maybe even up to three times, you know, three, I always say three strikes, you're out, when I used to be into sports. But if you haven't ever tried witnessing to them, try. Why? Because at one point in time, brothers and Christ, we were without God in the world and without hope in the world. We had no hope. Our future was bleak. Our future was hell. That's the future of this lost world. That's their future. They're going to hell to burn for all eternity and then tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Because death and hell is cast in the lake of fire. That's their future. They have no hope. What do we do? We go out and we preach hope. Another way of saying becoming broken as a sinner, you come before God realizing you have no hope. You're on your way to hell and you deserve to go to hell because of your sins and sinning against an almighty righteous God. It's going to judge you one day and send you to hell. You have no hope. You come to him broken. I'm without hope. Not that you don't have any hope. You're, that there is no hope. I'm sorry. It's that you realize you, as a lost sinner, have no hope. I began smoking even more than before to try and cope with what I have done because I felt it was for nothing. It was the only way I could distract myself. It became an endless cycle of just feeling completely empty. Then one day my brother and I stumbled upon a video on YouTube from, I don't know the guy's name, something Childs, I can't pronounce the, a T.N. Childs, exposing Freemasonry. I knew about Freemasons before, but I never knew how bad they really were. They are. They're, the Freemasons are very satanic. When I found out who they really worshipped and how badly they mocked Jesus Christ and how much they lied about history, I knew that he was real. I started looking up scriptures and started reading verses from a King James Bible online. I felt the need to read that version and that it was the correct version that I should be reading from. I eventually started reading Genesis and realized that everything made more sense than anything I was taught. I then got a hard copy and have been reading God's true word ever since. So she was reading a copy online and got a hard copy. But remember from the brother's testimony, he came across Brother Brian's video, The True Plan of Salvation, and shared that. I can't remember if she forgot to mention that, but he, she, he, in his testimony, he shared it with his sister. And so, that's, so she got a King James Bible and she just started reading it. Okay? But what started it, the pandemic pushed him away, the truth. Uh, I want truth. So they started looking on the line. Well, what about Freemasonry? What's, is it true or not? Oh, it's false. It's fake. Okay, I'm looking for truth. I'm looking for truth. The pandemic got them to start looking for truth. They started seeing how all these lies out there, the false religion of, of Catholicism, they wanted truth. They, she realized she was without hope in the world. 
Everything in life started to make sense. When you have God's Word and you study it, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify unto thy truth, thy word is truth. When the Holy Spirit comes in, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, when you start getting into this book and you start believing it, and you start reading it every day, and you start studying it, and you start listening to it, and you start obeying it, everything starts making more sense. Especially you see what's going on out in the world. God, this, this book has the world's number. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay. Sorry, I lost my pace. I then got a hard copy and been reading God's true word ever since. Everything in my life started to make sense. I don't feel empty anymore because the Lord came into my life and showed me what was what was missing from it. There is now meaning in my life. I cut out everything bad in my life. Praise the Lord. I stopped watching TV. Stopped fornicating. I cleaned up my diet even more. Stopped smoking. Praise the Lord. Stop smoking weed. I live very minimal now and have lost many... Th I live very minimal minimal now. Because the Bible talks about be with food and raiment, therewith be content. Food and raiment, therewith be content. You learn to live minimally and you're happy. God gives you joy and peace. You, I could have only one outfit, be in a small little shed that has a little bunk and a little wood stove, and I'd be happy. Why? Because God gives me His Word. He comes into my life. He's providing for me. You know? You learn to live minimal and you're happy. I live very minimal now and have lost many things, but I couldn't be happier because I have God with me. I'm glad that I'm able to share my testimony with a, such a godly man. You are living the way God intended, and I will pray that you will continue to be blessed by the Lord. Glory to God. Paul would always end this uh, letters with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus. He wanted God's grace upon people. He wanted God's uh, peace upon people, on the brethren. And love for one another. God's love. He loved him because God loved him and saved him. Um, so I want to get back because um, the other testimony she, she was talking about how she found truth. The other testimony was talking about uh, that they came across Brother Brian's uh, salvation message at King James Video Ministries, and I'll link it again below. Um, the true plan of salvation is repentance towards God. You come to God broken. We saw that in this testimony. She, she started getting miserable. She started looking at herself, saying that she was just disgusted by herself. She realized she was without hope in the world because of her sins. She's without hope in the world. Repentance, godly sorrow, repentance, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. You can have, you can have godly sorrow, or you can have worldly sorrow, you can't have both. She started to have sorrow, could have been a little bit worldly sorrow, but at some point it came over and became godly sorrow. She became broken. Okay? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Sorrow for her personal sins, the, the things that she did, the type of person she was. A lost, hell-bound sinner. She was sorry for it. Lord, I'm sorry. She had to come to Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I don't want to go to hell, but I deserve to go to hell. Lord, what can I do? Well, you cannot fix it. You have to believe on the you have to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and she did. Okay. Death, burial, and resurrection. But how he died, the blood that was shed was God's blood. God manifest in the flesh. God came down in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in the form of a of a lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the body of God. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross. He was beaten. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was chast the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He died. He rose again the third day, proving that he is God, fully and completely. 
you got to believe that his death, burial, and resurrection, that the blood that he was shed is God's blood and that it can wash your sins away. He paid the price that you were supposed to pay. You say, well, well, what then? That's when you fall on your knees before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. On my way to hell, I deserve to go to hell, Lord. But praise be to God, I believe in your Son, the Son of God. That the blood that was shed on the cross is God's blood, that it can wa that it washed my sins away. That He paid the price that I should have paid. He, he, was, he died and was buried and rose again the third day. Lord, please, please save me. The Bible says that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The Bible always talks about out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Okay? Confession is made unto salvation. You can't get around that. You can't get salvation until you confess your repentance and your belief to God and ask God to save you. Beg God to save you. Come to Him broken. Brothers and sisters Christ, come to Him broken. That's what we did. And the whole point is, brothers and sisters Christ, that I'm reading this like this, is there's people still getting saved. This pandemic's happening, and we're thinking, well, we're hoping God will come back any day now. God will come back any day now. And a lot of people are like, well, we need to make booklets and pamphlets and and I'm not against it. If you want to make a booklet and you want to make a pamphlet against the pandemic, go for it. But the point is, is we're not fighting the lost world when it comes to the pandemic. We're fighting for the souls of men. That's what we're fighting for. And like go back to what I talked about at the very beginning. This pandemic, I praise God for it. I praise God for it. You say, well, why? Because people are getting saved. It's waking Christians up. We might not have that much time left. I need to get busy working for the Lord. I don't have that much rewards. I haven't done that much for the Lord. I don't have much rewards. I need to get busy for the Lord. It's waking Christians up. It's waking them up to the Babel building system. A lot of them are coming out of the Babel building system. This is being used for God's glory. Okay, instead of saying, getting so distracted that we've got to fight the lost world when it comes to the pandemic. We need to fight for lost souls. We need to stand firm to the Word of God and living for the Word of God. They come to your door saying, take this shot. I will not take this shot, the death shot, because the Bible says such and such. Because that's not the cure. But let me tell you about the cure. Let me tell you about the real cure. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ and what He did for you. And you go through and present the Gospel to Him. Brethren, we need to stand more and more for this Word of God in our lives that we're living. We're supposed to be a light to this world by the light, the life we're living. Absolutely. Call this junk out that's going on in the world as it is. It's wickedness, it's sin, it's deception, it's fake, it's false. But you always bring Jesus into it. You always bring salvation into it. You always give God glory in all things. You always give God thanks in all things. What's going on out there, give God glory. People are getting saved, brothers and sisters in Christ. All heaven, all the angels rejoice and sing over one soul that is lost, that it gets saved. Brethren that have fallen flat on their face are getting back up. Praise the Lord. Ministries, if you're a man in ministry, my advice to you, I know it's just me. I'm... Get busy working for the Lord. If you truly believe that the church is going to go through some hard times, which I believe is a dangerous teaching to keep teaching, that we're going to be here for long, 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 long. No, we're supposed to be teaching Jesus can come back any day. you got food and raiment therewith, be content. Get back to doing the work of the Lord. If you truly believe Jesus, like I do, that Jesus is going to come back any day, we're going to get busy for the Lord. Videos. Handing out Gospels. If I could, I'd start a house church. Okay, street miss. If I had more brethren here, like you have a house church and you have some brethren, start doing street witnessing again. Uh, preaching the gospel on the streets. Handing out gospel tracts on the streets. Okay, going out and preaching the gospel. Okay, we need to be doing the work of the Lord. Jesus could come back any day. If you believe we're going to be here, we're going to be going through some hard times, and you want to preach and teach that, then you need to live up to it. And you need to be out there preaching the word of God hardcore every week multiple times a week 
You need to be preaching the word of the Lord. Encourage the brethren to stand their ground when it comes to the word of God. To make sure they're loving one another. We're praying for one another. That you're hiding this word in your heart. And you're teaching, like I said, as a preacher or a teacher, that you're teaching this. When we see what's going on out there, it should motivate us to want to do more for the Lord. It shouldn't be the opposite where we're just falling away and we're hardly doing anything anymore. I see that sometimes. It should be a motivation. Okay, people are more open to the gospel. We need to preach the gospel more. People are more, uh, brethren that have fallen flat on their face, they're more open now to be lifted up. Start correcting through the word of God. Start doing uh, teachings that convict them. Preaching and teaching that convicts the body, that convicts the body of Christ that have fallen down to get back up. When Jesus comes back, you want to be in a standing position, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's the fear of the Lord for the life of a Christian. You fear God. When he comes back, you want to be in a standing position. You want to be bold in the day of judgment. You want him to look at you and say, Well done, thou good and faithful one. You don't want him looking at you going, Boy, boy, did you start slacking off in these last days. Boy, did you really just decide to just, you know, kind of do, go your own way and do your own thing. Or let things distract you. Brother, sister in Christ, if you believe as I do that Jesus, I still believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. If you believe Jesus Christ could come back any day now as I do, then you're going to get busy working for the Lord, abounding in the work of the Lord. And I'm not talking about everybody, like the sisters in Christ, going with your husband to hand out gospel tracts. If you're single, handing out gospel tracts, leaving gospel tracts places, getting into this book and reading it more, memorizing scripture, memorizing hymns, singing hymns. Uh, men in ministry, like I said, crank out those Bible studies. Get back to fellowshipping with the brethren, whether through Skype, uh, through any other video me uh, media that's online where you can talk to people face to face. Get back to writing letters. Get those emails back opened up again, and, and get back to the emails and everything. And uh, you need to get those bit, that bitterness in your heart. If you have bitterness towards some of the brethren in, in Christ, you need to get that bitterness out of your heart. You need to get that hate out of your heart. You need to drop the pride. That goes for everybody, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hate, bitterness, pride. Get it out of there. Get it gone. Gone. Get back to doing the work of the Lord. We need to come together, brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to come together. Now, I can keep saying it over and over, come together, come together. But I'm really pushing that I think in these last days, you know, the number one thing I think will help the body of Christ, and it might not happen, but I think a strong thing that will help the body of Christ is if people start coming together, forming house churches again. Uh, just like you did in the old days. Every, like, save people that are in Oregon, because I'm in Oregon. Save people in Oregon. If it means you have to move to be in the same area, then you move to be in the same area. For you, California, whether you're over here, whatever you're over there, come together. It can be a small, like, five-man house church. It doesn't matter. But I think what's really, really going to help the brethren in these tough times is if we come together and work together. We start coming together and singing hymns together praying together. I know my main thing is when you pray to God's one-on-one, -on -one, but praying for each other. Okay? Uh, doing Bible studies. Being there to help each other out when it comes to food and raiment. Being there together to help carry each other through these hard times. Jesus is ultimately carrying all of us, but as the body of Christ. Okay? That's why I keep pushing. It's like, if I could, I'd start one here. In fact, I'll even say this, right now, as of right now, house church of one. <laughs> it's not really a house church unless there's two. You know, before two are gathered together, or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. So just being me, it's just me. But if the second brother came in the area and we started meeting together, I'd be like, we're going to start a house church. And he would probably agree, I want to do this. Let's do a house church. We sit here and meet once a week, talk about the Lord, His Word, what's going on in the world, sing some hymns. Pray for one another. Hold each other accountable to the Word of God. Encourage one another. Uh, we're getting too used to the Internet. What happens when the Internet goes down? What happens when people like me, brethren, brother and sister Christ, but brethren in ministry like me, get kicked off? What happens then? The body of Christ is going to be like ugh, going frantic. Well, we need to plan ahead. You need to start thinking about house churches. You need to start thinking about, okay... Who's in my area? And, and I mean my area by state. Who's in my state? If I have to move closer to the brother and we all got to move to a closer area that's inexpensive, then we all move to that area and start a house church. Brother and sister Christ, people are getting saved. Okay, people are getting saved. 
the doors are not closed. It's just in the future, I believe the door, some doors will close. Internet will close. Right. So I've rambled on enough. Brother, sister, Christ, I love my brother, sister, Christ. I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. And I just want to thank the brethren out there, all the brethren out there, for your prayers, not just for me, but for the body of Christ, for people like this sister in Christ. We're always praying that, Lord, open the eyes of the lost world. Open those eyes up that are bl blinded. Help us to reach the gospel, preach the gospel to the lost world. We want to see people get saved, Lord. We don't want to see people go to hell. I don't take pleasure in people going to hell. I don't take any pleasure in people going to hell. I, I'm all for saying... Uh, one of the things I disagree real quick, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. I agree with saying that somebody who did, who rejected Jesus Christ, or you can prove they were a false convert, they're dead, and they're in hell right now to say that person's in hell, to God be the glory. His judgment's true. That person's in hell. But present tense, telling someone they're, they're going to be in hell, present tense, no. We're supposed to tell them that's their destination. That's where they're heading. Anybody can get saved. You're heading for hell. But sometimes people can get ahead of themselves and prejudge and say, you're just destined for hell. You're going to hell, period. That's why I'm not teaching the, preaching the gospel to you. No, you still need to be preaching the gospel to them. They're on their way to hell. That's their destination. But that destination can be changed. Brother says Christ, God saved me. If God can save me, he can save, and he can save you, brother and sister Christ, he can save that man out there that you think just thinks it looks like it's so hopeless but he can still God can still save that man he can still save that woman now they might not want to be saved the door might be slammed in your face but we're not supposed to have that attitude like we're acting like we're God and we can see everything I can't see everything all I can see is a man that needs Jesus Christ and I need to get out there and preach to that man that needs Jesus Christ and if he says I've had people when I go to hand him gospel track and try to talk to him sorry I don't want the gospel track no I don't want to hear it okay and I keep walking door closed but like I said the door is open by me running into that person and talking just to ask that person how is he doing and going to hand him a gospel track we can't forget that we're mainly here to win souls the sanctification why do you think there's the sanctification in the life of a Christian well so you can be closer to God absolutely but it goes back to this is a whole other teaching about the light that we have in us the more sanctified we are and the right, more right we are with the Lord and His Word, living a godly life, the more that light shines to the lost world to win souls to Christ. Okay, There's a lot more to it. It's not just, I've cleaned up my life, so it's just me, just me, just me. No, you're a light to the world. You're a light to the Christians that they're not as bright as you are, that they can be as bright as you are and shine as bright as you are. There's a lot more to it, brothers and Christ. So... Praise the Lord for this sister in Christ. There are still brethren getting saved today. Okay? The work of the Lord needs to abound. More than anything, we need to get hardcore, brother says Christ. The work of the Lord needs to abound even more. If we truly believe we're heading for hard times, we need to abound more in the work of the Lord. We need to get busy for the work of the Lord. We need to get busy coming together, and we need to get busy praying for one another. And like I said, I thank you for your prayers. Uh, I've only took donations once. Another video we might talk about donations, but I, God's provided for me clothes, food, roof. There was a time where I was I couldn't afford the camera, and the brethren helped me buy the camera. And I want to thank you guys again for your help, um, brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to focus on the work of the Lord. Dirt poor, rich, good times, bad times. We need to uh, we need to focus on doing the work of the Lord, no matter what. No matter how hard it gets out here, no matter how poor we get, we need to continue to focus on the work of the Lord. Why? For people like this sister in Christ, like her brother, like all the other brethren. I've got some other letters from other brethren all over the world, uh, Great Britain, um, Belgium, talk to a brother in Nor Norway. These are all newly saved within the last year. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's why we need to stay strong. For these people, there's still people getting out. There's still people getting saved. The doors are closing. I, I admit, I was part of that group. The doors are closed. They don't want it. They don't want it. And I kind of tried to avoid it a little bit. I can't avoid it anymore. Yes, the doors are closing. 
but they're not closed yet. There's still time to preach the gospel. And we need to be preaching the word of God to the brethren, and we need to be preaching the gospel to the lost world. We need to be emailing each other. You need to find some brethren that you can fellowship with to pray for each other, to encourage one another, to talk about the Word of God together. You need to get into the fellowship mode and get away from this I walk alone mode. Okay? Paul used to put in his letters that I'm there with you in spirit. The Lord is with you all the time, and the body of Christ as a whole in spirit, we're with you. Okay? There is no walking alone. Do your best, brother and sister Christ, to come together as the body of Christ. Times aren't that hard where we're getting separated and thrown in prison separately and we're going to have to stand there and just try to, you know, it hasn't gotten that hard yet. Those doors haven't closed, uh, the doors to us being there for one another haven't closed. We need to come together. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please take this to heart. Please take this to heart. And pray. And try to see if the Lord will open doors for you guys to come together. Like I said, I definitely think we need house churches. We definitely need house churches. The brethren need to come together. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Grace and peace, especially in these dark days. Get people saved, Lord. Help us to lead people to you so you can save people. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you for watching.